first, you should know that state-of-the-art bio nanotechnology isn't really that exciting. It's actually kind of rather boring. It's like working with stone tools, but on the nanometer scale. It's like people go out into nature, they pick something up that's lying around, they take it and whack it against something else. There you have your tool. So this is, of course, a little bit exaggerated, but there's some truth to it. So what is technology? So technology, typically, would call something technology if you have some you know, reasonably sophisticated artifact that serves some purpose, and somebody has built this through a process uh, of rational design. Right? In order to do that, you need some kind of fundamental understanding of the material you're using, you need some control over matter. And ideally, you have that from first principles, from a deep understanding of the physics behind the thing you're trying to build. And really, we don't really have that kind of control on the molecular scale. So what actually would be then exciting bio nanotech, sophisticated bio nanotechnology that deserves this attribute? Well, let's have a look into a cell to see this. So what you see here is a cartoon of a bacterium uh, drawn by David Goodsell. So the yellow stuff in the middle is actually um, the genomic information, it's DNA molecules. And then you see some cyan and purple uh, stuff surrounding the yellow uh, molecules. So this, these are RNA and protein molecules. So this is the, the hardware actually that keeps the cell alive, does all the work inside of the, inside of the cell. So let's have a closer look at one of these, uh, you know, one of this type of molecular hardware that you can find inside of bacteria. So I picked one specific example here. It is actually a protein complex that's sitting in the, in, in the inner membrane of these bacteria. So it's um, surrounded here in a, in a red box. So every cell on Earth actually runs on ATP. So every cell on Earth actually has an ATP synthase. It's an enzyme that makes ATP molecules. So um, this is a slightly more sophisticated uh, um, rendering or you know, depiction of the ATP synthases. You actually see two of these molecules, so these you know, inverted mushrooms. And you find them in the inner membrane of bacteria. And you also find them in the, actually in the, in the membranes of mitochondria and organelle in your cells. So these uh, ATP synthases are just 50 nanometers small, so that's really, really small. Um, they consist of about 50,000 atoms. And actually, when a bacterium eats, and also when we eat, all the food, all the energy intake is being used up by other enzymes to build a concentration gradient. Um, in our case of hydrogen ions, uh, that falls across the membrane in which these ATP synthases sit. So in the case of bacteria, it's a sodium gradient. So there's a greater number of sodium ions that's in the upper compartment compared to the lower compartment. So this is a non-equilibrium situation. So there's a flux of ions that tries to go through this membrane. And these ATP synthases actually have tiny channels that provide a path for, uh, for which these ions can flow. So what happens actually that this flux of ions drives a rotary movement in these tiny molecular machines. And this rotation of this rotor inside of this uh, you know, mushroom-shaped cap it uses cyclical deformations, which lead to an opening and closing of tiny um, binding pockets. And then in the lower compartment, you have these yellow things that are floating around. These are ADP and uh, phosphate molecules. So these are actually can diffuse into these binding pockets. And upon further rotation of this rotor, they're being placed just in the right uh, relative position orientation as to catalyze actually the formation of a covalent bond. Now it comes a bigger molecule, a molecule that has more energy, ATP. So these ADP synthesis really has really amazing chemical factories. They synthesize larger molecules, higher energy compounds, by just placing atoms at the right positions in space. So it's something that modern day chemists have not achieved. So these ADP synthesis, they make about three ATP molecules per full rotation. They can do up to 200,000 revolutions per minute. So these are really, you know, really amazing, uh, you know, molecular machines. And somebody once made the numbers, it turns out that about two-thirds of our body weight actually is being synthesized in novo in sheer mass of ATP every day in our bodies. So my case is about like 55 kilogram. So you can imagine this bag of ATP powder that's being made every day in your bodies through ATP synthesis. And these ATP and synthesis, these enzymes, are just one of thousands of fascinating molecular machines that you can find in cells. So evolution has created all this zoo, this plethora of powerful market machinery. So we know what's possible technologically on the market scale. But we as humans, so far, we can just ponder about these uh, natural market machines. We can try to understand how they work. But we have not yet reached the level of understanding which allows us to build, actually, market machines from scratch. So clearly, it's not satisfying, and it needs to be changed. 
So um, that's one of the goals uh, of my research. I like to learn how to construct complex microstructures and machines based on first principles. And the dream is that once we know how to build sufficiently complex microstructures, then it may hopefully be possible to actually really realize functions in those synthetic structures that today we know only from natural micro micro machines. So a dream, you could dream of synthetic micro motors, synthetic enzymes, the catalyst, user-defined chemical reactions. You can dream of smart drug delivery vehicles that borrow ideas from viruses, but are really completely uh, engineered by humans. So particles, they can go to particular cell types, take a decision whether or not that cell maybe is affected, or maybe, um, you know, anyway, maybe it's a bacterium uh, that you'd like to remove from your body, so maybe you can deliver drug then with these, um, with these particles. So this is a bit of science fiction, so now I'd like to share some progress with you. So what we and others are trying to do is we're trying to adapt the very same principle that actually nature uses to build market structures. So everything in nature um, actually is encoded in sequences from the level of molecules up to whole organisms, right? We all encode in sequences. So um, I guess most of you know that uh, when two DNA molecules with complementary sequences uh, find each other, bump into each other, they can uh, hybridize and self-assemble into a right-handed DNA double helix. But DNA molecules can do more than that. If you design them in, a, in the right way, you can actually have them uh, interact with multiple binding partners, not just two uh, forming a single DNA double helix. So for example, let's, th uh, let's think about these five molecules that I have drawn here. So um, if the blue one, for example, would form partially double, hel double helices with the green molecule on, and, the, and the pink molecule and the orange molecule, and you do something similar with the sequences for the other strands, you could, for example, build this tiny little square with double helices coming off the edges of the square. So this is the key concept, actually, that we use. Multiple DNA molecules, sequences of multiple DNA molecules, molecules can be designed in a particular way to create more complex shapes. So the original idea was conceived about 30 years ago, actually, already, by Nadrian Seaman. And ever since, people like me and others have worked uh, to push this concept to much greater complexity. So now I want to, I want to show you a, a modern uh, marker structure that has been self-assembled from designed DNA sequences. So what you see here is an electron density map, so it's experimental data that has been determined using a cryo-electron microscope. So it shows you the, you know, the structure of, a, of an object that's been purely, that's been assembled from about 160 DNA molecules that have designed sequences. So you can think of this as a, as a rigid mesh in which DNA double helices, and this now, right now they're pointing into the, into the screen plane, are lined in parallel. So um, we have to do this fly-through, because the guy who rendered the movie uh, really liked this Death Star uh, scene. So um, anyway, so now you see some cross-sectional slicing for the structure. You see the, these kind of circles, these tiny circles. So these are the cross-sections of individual DNA double helices. And if you focus on one of them, you can see that these helices periodically form connections with the neighbors. This is an internal network of uh, 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 backbone bonds that actually stabilize the entire structure. And then we do a lateral slicing. You will see that the, the resolution in the interior of the structure gets up. You see the signatures of DNA double helices, like major and minor groove. But now they're all connected and to build this kind of structure. So um, uh, now if you have this kind of data, you can also try to um, fit an atomic model into the structure. So this may, may give you a better sense of how, um, you know, an atom may give you a better atomistic picture of the actual structure. So this approach um, that we've developed to build structures of DNA is actually quite general. You can think of this as a rule set that really starts from first principles. You can apply it and build many types of different structures. So what you see now is actually uh, 28 different objects that we have built um, about in the course of the last year. So they have all been determined. These are structures that have been determined using cryo microscopy. So, and all, all of these objects are just made from DNA molecules with designed sequences. So they have dimensions that are range from 10 to 300 nanometer. They will look totally different. Some of them actually have degrees of freedom, so they can flop around a particular way, but they're being held rigid for the um, purpose of structural reconstruction. So we're zooming in into one of them, and like the smaller one, you can see again the signatures of DNA double helices, this major and minor groove. And then you would, if you look closely, you would see the connections that hold the helices together. So um, this is kind of an overview um, that shows the diversity of shapes that can be made. And so there's a defined rule set with which you can make these kind of objects. Okay, so we have a method to make DNA molecules self-assemble into custom shapes. 
So then we try to uh, develop methods that allow us to self-assemble these custom shapes, these components, into yet higher order objects. Why would you be interested in doing that? Well, because in order to build machines, I think it seems obvious that you may want to integrate components that have different functions into a more complex uh, system. So this is something that we do in a macroscopic scale. We take trivially shaped individual pieces, put them together to make a more complex uh, machine. But it's also true actually in nature on a nanoscopic scale. So this is yet another picture of the ATP synthase. And it's actually a protein complex. You, know, you can make an explode of you, and it shows you the different components of the ATP synthase. And if different protein molecules have different functions, and together they actually make this thing work. So let me show you an example of how you can uh, build higher order structures um, from components that have been uh, assembled from DNA molecules. So first uh, example I'd like to show are virus-like shells, capsids, that maybe we can use in the future for drug delivery tasks. First I'd like to show you um, um, like a macroscopic model of the objects that we have built. So it is like a one million times magnified uh, variant of the structure that we uh, encoded DNA sequences these tiny little cylinders illustrate, are meant to indicate DNA double helices. So you have this triangular subunit, it has these beveled edges, and the bevel angle is such that, when, so such that when multiple copies of these triangles come together, it will build a closed cage. So then you can see that these tiny protrusions and recessions at these edges, and they're actually self-complementary, and on the macroscopic scale you have these tiny magnets. So when these things come together, they can actually stick and uh, you know, remain bound. On a molecule scale, we have a similar type of glue that will engage when these uh, nanoscale objects come into contact. So on a macro scale, you can take like eight copies of this triangle, put them into a sphere, and start to shake them, and then lo and behold, they can actually self-assemble and make a closed container. So the same thing happens sort of analogously on the nanometer scale in solution, where we mix high concentrations of these components and have them self-assemble. So using the system, we were able to make um, various types of virus-like capsids, and again, uh, analyze the structure using cryo microscopy. So you can see here um, four different types of shells that we have built. And each of these shells is made from a different type of triangle. So the, um, the blue icosahedron, uh, second from the left, actually is made from, this, uh, from a blue triangle, which is equilateral, um, and it's self-complementary on all, on all edges. Um, then the slightly larger shell is like the second from the right, actually contains 60 copies of this yellow triangular subunit, which is no longer equilateral and has a different type of uh, self-interaction. And actually, to build this uh, even larger one, you need two different types of triangles to make that. But all of this self-assembles. And you can maybe imagine that maybe now we could build uh, a different type of triangle that when it self-assembles makes a closed container that no longer has any holes. And then you can think about a way to encapsulate maybe a drug molecule and have it uh, encapsulated in these kind of shells. Okay, that was one example. I want to share another one, uh, rotary mechanisms. So my dream is one day to build a rotary motor, and one step about into the direction of rotary mechanism, uh, into a rotary motor is to actually build a rotary mechanism. So in a macroscopic scale, I mean, it's rather easy to put something together that can freely rotate. But on a nanometer scale in solution, there is no assembler, right? So the components need to meet each other in a particular way so that still something can freely rotate. So that uh, actually poses a tricky assembly problem. So this is one solution that we found, uh, how we can deal with. So we take this, um, this, again, just an illustration, how the assembly works. So um, we take this blue component, and we can actually dock it one half of a structure that later will become the stator. Then we close the stator by adding another component, and we uh, lower some brackets and uh, hybridize them um, using multiple DNA molecules. And then we can actually, now the rotor is trapped in this cavity, and we can release it from the docking site. And now it actually should be free to rotate. Um, so. I stress that we haven't actually built a motor, we have just built a mechanism, and it should be free to rotate. So when you imagine you would take this mechanism and you put it on a surface by fixing maybe the stator to the surface, then on the nanoscale in solution, you would expect that this rotor would be kicked around by collisions with the solvent randomly. Therefore, it would uh, undergo stochastic rendering, uh, stochastic rotary movements. And this is, what you, this is what we expect to see, actually, in order to see whether this actually happens, we um, made a variant of this mechanism where we lengthened this kind of crank lever from 100 nanometer to 500 nanometer, so we can actually observe the movement in an above diffraction fluorescence microscope. We added fluorescent dyes, and then we could actually follow um, the movement of this particle uh, in a fluorescence microscope. And now the movie on the bottom right that you can see is actually real time, 
um, video of one of those mechanisms rotating um, back and forth. So this is a mechanism. It does undirected uh, rotary movements. Basically, we have a rotor that rotates around the axis. And now the question is how we can turn it into a motor. And um, the future will see where we'll, where we'll be able to pull this off. So uh, during the last years, um, we have worked hard to improve the structural and functional complexity of structures that can be encoded in DNA sequences. We started at the very beginning with various methods to encode shapes and sequences. Then we focused on uh, methods to robustly synthesize these kind of objects. We worked on making how to make higher order assemblies. We started to think about how we can make mechanisms, particles that can move in a particular way. We are trying to improve the accuracy of design. And then one thing that I maybe want to mention, because it's very important um, for applications, is mass production. So for all of our objects, we need DNA molecules with design sequences. And so far, DNA uh, molecules are actually being made using chemical synthesis. And at the mass and quantities that we'd like to have, this is too expensive. So we came up with a different process, a biotechnological, biotechnological process that, that allows us to grow the mass quantities of, the, of DNA nanostructures, DNA molecules, um, using bacteria. So, and the nice thing about this system is that you can basically have these bacterial cultures, you can cultivate it in a small beaker, but you can also take an 800 liter tank and scale this whole system up and then harvest a lot of material from these cell cultures. So with this process, we're able to cut, to cut the costs from 100,000 euro per gram to like 100 euro per gram. So depending on, on the type of application that may be still too expensive, nonetheless for a biomedical applications, for example, that now really is something that, uh, allows us to work on this. So what you, should, what you see here is sort of the first macroscopic actually uh, uh, quantity of a DNA nanostructure. You know, it's just a powder. You see nothing to it and the structures in there actually have no particular function. But it's just to illustrate that we have a, a process in, in place that allows us to actually make the quantities that enable testing uh, objects actually in real organisms. So what's next? Um, so the technology that I've shown you today, um, you can use it actually to build various types of basic science tools already. You can think of this as niche applications and fundamental research. You can build little scientific tools that allow you to, to study, for example, market structures and interactions in greater detail, simply because you manipulate objects at a very tiny scale. Um, you can also build model systems that will help you to uh, elucidate, for example, the origin of function in market market structures. But tomorrow, I hope we will really be able to uh, unlock various types of biomedical, biomedical products, like new types of vaccines, drug delivery vehicles. Maybe there will be new types of materials that take advantage of the fact that we have control over the land scale. And what I really dream of is uh, building market motors. Because if you think about industrial revolution on the macro scale, it really had to do with motors. Right? If you want to build something, you want to change something, uh, take a system from a low energy state to a high energy state, you read motors. And on a nanoscale, we don't have that yet, but maybe things will you know, improve a lot once we have those. Thank you for your attention.